Hello everyone, this is the third video and the third problem from last year's second round. Firstly, sorry for the lag and the background noise in the earlier videos. Uh, we are in a school after all, which means that firstly, there are neighboring classrooms and students, and second of all, there is uh, limited hardware capabilities here. So sorry about that, but I hope that at least the solutions are clear enough. Now, on to question three. Uh, n1, n2 to nk is a sequence of positive integers such that for i less than j less than equals to k, the decimal representation of ni does not occur as the leftmost digits of the decimal representation of nj. Okay, so let's just try to uh, digest that first using the example, which says 1, 2, 3 cannot precede 1, 2, 3, 5, 4, 3, 6 in the sequence. Decimal representation just means base 10. Uh, which is our usual computations are done in base 10, our usual numbers. So nothing to worry about there. It doesn't really mean decimal places. Um, I less than J less than or equals to K, and then N I and J just means that uh, if you have a sequence of numbers, the earlier number cannot appear as the front part of a later number. So prove that if you add up all the reciprocals of numbers in your sequence, the upper bound is 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 quarter until 1 over 9. The equality case is, I think, fairly obvious because if you have uh, 1 to 9, then your left-hand side is really going to be 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 until 1 over 9. So it is fairly clear how this is going to happen. Now, what the question is asserting is that you cannot do better than this in terms of largeness. Well, for one thing, we see that if we started with 1 to 9, then there's a dead end, right? Because once you start with 1 to 9, you can't put anything else after that because your first digit cannot be 1, it cannot be 2, it cannot be 3, it cannot be 4, it cannot be anything until 9. So if you started with 1 to 9, that's all. So you know you cannot fit anything else after that. But if we don't start with 1 to 9, well, what, what other sort of things can we do? Well, uh, for instance, let's say that we did 1 to 8. And then for 9, we don't actually want to use 9 as 9 itself. Well, that means that I can do something like uh, 90, 91, 92, until 99. Right? This is something I can do. And if I did that, now I'm stuck. Uh, I'm stuck because I've used 9, 0, 9, 1, 9, 2, until 9, 9, so there is no more space left for me. We also noticed that uh, for this portion, we took 1 over 90 plus 1 over 91 until 1 over 99. This is actually going to be uh, smaller than 10 times of 1 over 90, which is 1 over 9. So uh, that's as expected, right? It is supposed to be less than or equal to 1 plus half plus 1 third until 1 over 9. So in that case, it now feels pretty intuitively obvious. It feels intuitively obvious because what we are saying is that let's say that I don't use something and I just use some of its descendants. Now, the descendants are not going to be able to give me anything better. So what I mean by descendants, let's say that we have the tree of I'm not going to write all of them down. Let's say we have 1 to 9. Now, for 1 to 9, 1 has 10 descendants from 11 to 19. And then uh, 10 itself has a bunch of descendants from 100 to 109. And then let's say 19 itself has descendants from 190 to 199, and so on. So you just have a giant tree, so to speak. Now, what we're saying here is that if you pick one of these uh, branches in your tree, one of these nodes in your tree rather, you cannot pick any of its descendants. So for example, if I pick one, then the entire tree cannot be picked anymore. If I don't pick one, I can pick, let's say, 10 to 19. Or if I don't want to pick 19, then I can pick some of those from here and if let's say that in between something like 194, I didn't pick it, then I can go with 1940 to 1949. I can pick some of these. 
Right, so this is essentially the choices that we have. Intuitively, we are saying that it's actually better to pick higher up the tree because when you pick something at the bottom of the tree, let's say if you pick all of these, it still loses to just picking the parent, the 10 on top of it. Using a bit of uh, computer science terminologies uh, slash graph terminologies. So if you're not so familiar with that, I hope it still makes sense intuitively what I mean by a tree, uh, just like a tree diagram for probability. Now, proving this is another method, right? How do we actually show this uh, rigorously, even though the intuition is very clear? It is possible to go with some sort of argument that says, that, okay, we start with one and then we start just breaking into branches and breaking it and breaking and breaking and breaking. And throughout doing that process, we claim that you're always going to make things smaller. That's one way to go about it. But instead of going top down, I think it makes sense to go bottom up. Now, it's a bit strange to say bottom up because the bottom numbers are actually bigger. But when I say bottom, I mean bottom of this tree that I have drawn here. So I want to say that if I select something, this is the best I can do starting from that node. And this is the best I can do starting from that node. This is the best I can do starting with that node and just move back up the tree. This is what I have to do. So I'm going to just define a few things. Um, so I'm just going to let is a better color. Let SI be the set of numbers that start with I. Now take note that I can be any integer. So for example, if you have something like S12 is going to be 12, then 120, 121, 129, there one, two, zero, zero, and so on. Okay, so this is the set that I am defining over here. Now I am also going to define uh, f of a set to be just the sum of its reciprocals of everything in the set. And uh, f of the empty set, I'll just define it to be zero because there's nothing in there. So what I'm now going to claim is that f of any of my sets, as i, is at most going to be one over i. So this should make some sense, right? So I'm saying that if I want to pick from all the numbers starting with 12, the best thing I could do is just pick 12 and then one over 12 is the best I can do. Okay, now how am I supposed to show this in an inductive uh, fashion? I say inductive fashion. Huh? I'm supposed to show this in an inductive fashion. But the problem is that how exactly am I going to do this in a rigorous fashion when my branches depends on things that come later, right? Let's say for 12, it depends on what I do with 120, 121, or 129. Well, this is where I said we want to go bottom up. So I'm actually going to do this by induction from largest to smallest. And you might say, wait, you mean that we can induct starting from infinity? That doesn't make sense. Uh, no, uh, we are not going to start inducting from infinity. There is no such thing as inducting from infinity. I just need to induct from large enough. So if let's say that the largest term nk have, has uh, m digits. Because m digits, that just means that uh, all of these terms, all the way to nk, are all going to be less than uh, 10 to the power of n.
So I'm going to now uh, do induction backwards from M digits. So I will induct on the number of digits of I. Uh, starting from m digits and I subject it to the condition that uh, all of these are going to have at most m digits. Okay, so how does the induction proceed? Uh, the base case is simple. Now if i has m digits, then the only m digit number that starts with i is I itself. So your set can either be just I itself or the empty set. So the maximum of f of the set is just going to be 1 over i. So the base case is trivial. Now we will show the induction by going backwards. I forgot to say backwards my induction step. So suppose that I have got uh, I to have uh, K digits to work. I write this, I write this F of S I less than or equal to one over I for any K digit number I. Now let I have K minus one digit, so uh, A1, A2 to A K minus one. So there are two cases for how I can construct my set. If I construct my set to include I, Then I cannot include anything else, right? Because uh, the set of numbers starting with i. Sorry, I shouldn't write i is in s i, right? So I want to say that. Uh, hmm. Sorry, uh, I realized that I forgot to mention something a bit earlier, right? I should have said that uh, s i is the set of numbers that start with i in the sequence. And I wanted to say that this is a subset. So, yeah, otherwise f of si is just fixed, right? So that wouldn't make any sense. It's not less than or equal to, it's going to be much bigger, sorry. So uh, let me just repeat, uh, I meant to say that uh, si is the set of numbers starting with i that are in the sequence n1, n2 to nk. Yeah, now this will work. Otherwise, all of the things I said are a bit confusing. So if S i contains i, meaning that i itself is in the sequence, then S i can only be i itself. Everything else starting with i cannot be included later on. So f of S i is going to be 1 over i itself. Now, if i is not in the set, then that means that your SI is going to include all of the following subsets. So it is, I'll use a union of J equals to zero to nine of S a1, a2 to the ak minus 1, j. Basically, I mean that i followed by a 0, i followed by a 1, i followed by a 2, all the way until i followed by a 9. So it will just be the union of these. And by the induction hypothesis, 
these are going to be less than or equals to 1 over those things. This is actually just 10i plus j. I wrote it like this. So it's 10i plus 0, 10i plus 1 until 10i plus 9. And using the intuition we generated all the way back at the start, we know that this is less than 10 times of 1 over 10i which is equal to 1 over i. Yeah, so that is our induction step. So by induction, uh, our statement is true. And, uh, okay, not the whole statement, our claim is true. And so if our claim is true, then all the way back to uh, the starting sum this sum is just going to consist of some numbers starting with 1, some numbers starting with 2, some numbers starting with 3 until 9 so it's just going to be a function applied to sorry I forgot the f on top now I realize that again f of S1, f of S2, until f of S9, which is less than or equal to precisely the right-hand side. Now, this sounds like a cop-out, but uh, the reason why I'm trying to do this um, so-called live is that, yeah, mistakes happen. Right, when you're writing your proof, uh, you will miss some details or you will mess up some of your notation because this is not very easy to just do on the fly. So that's why you need to be very careful to check back again. Like for example, if you just wrote SI is the set, then anyone who reads the solution is going to be very confused. Because I'm explaining it to you, you kind of, I hope, uh, already knew what I was trying to say. Uh, even though by the time when I got here, then I realized that, oops, I forgot to mention that, let me just edit it. This is how a lot of your solutions are going to look like for round two. It's not going to be so smooth as to be, oh, first attempt, very nicely written. So this is not an essay. Right? This is not a compo. Uh, you can write it a, a quick, messy draft, and you would still have time to write a proper solution later on. Right here, I already have solved the question, so I'm just now trying to present it. But if, let's say, you're still in the process of solving it, don't expect that whatever you're writing is going to be a coherent solution. It's going to be a big mess. So write it again separately after you have completely solved the question and convinced yourself. Right? Only after you've convinced yourself can you hope that your solution will convince anybody else. All right, so that's it for this video and this third problem. There are two more problems left. Question four is quite okay, and question five is going to be really long. So... Uh, let me know if you have any questions below. Hope the audio is a little bit better this time. Let me know if it is uh, still unclear to you. Thanks everyone and see you next time.